you know, Allah Azza wa Jal is not just prescribing the way that you can be grateful to Him for the blessings that you recognize, but also teaching you to recognize blessing and some of the things that you might see as constricting, right? And some of these orders, some of these structures, some of these rules, laws, you know, might come off as constriction. And that also is something that we should thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for. So when one tries to be a good person, the best that they can be, you will notice the more you know about yourselves is the more you know about your sins. Uh, how come the Prophet was not sent in this ethnicity or that tribe? How come the Prophet wasn't this gender or that gender nowadays, right? The ayah in Surah Nisa says, وَلَا تَتَمَنَّوا مَا فَضَّلَ Allah." Don't wish. What's happening in here? Do you wish something different than what Allah's perfect wisdom has ordained? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, dear brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Quran 30 for 30. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Today we are joined by Sheikh Abdullah Duru and of course Sheikh Muhammad al Shinawi, Abu Abad. How you doing, Sheikh? How are you? Jazakallah khair. Alhamdulillah. Brooklyn's finest, mashallah. And uh, you know, we're matching today, alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Yeah, thank you, Baba. This was a, this was, <laughs> this was a gift from Sheikh Omar Sulaiman. And so I had to wrap it today. I don't have the pally socks, but oh, yeah. I'm working on it. I'm glad you noticed that. Zakallah. <laughs> Sheikh Abdullah, you, you didn't get the memo, man. You didn't get the memo. You were in Umrah when um, I brought these back from the UK. So, so you didn't bring I, one for you, me. I, I have one for you. It expired, right? It's, like, it's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's at the house. Inshallah, we'll, we'll, we'll give it to you when we get back. Inshallah. So, I got you. I got you. Some, yes, of, some of the, uh, the other episodes, you, you'll have one on. Inshallah, I got of course. You. I got you covered, man. Inshallah. Inshallah. Uh, Sheikh, how's it going? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. How have Inshallah. you been? Hanging in there. Alhamdulillah. Allah yabarak May Allah Azza wa reward you Amen. and increase Amen. you. Uh, we're blessed to have you. Alhamdulillah. Uh, with us. Your papers, by the way, I'm going to put you on the spot. Your papers are the most read papers at Yaqeen. So are you working on a paper right now? Yes. Uh, actually, you were in Nigeria, I believe it was, when someone uh, asked you to record a, a voice note for me. Uh, to write on Allah's name, Al Jabbar. Ghana, next. Ghana, yes, Ghana, Ghana, there we yes, go. Yes, uh -huh. So, Alhamdulillah, that paper is underway. That's going to be the really? next thing of Allah. I hope they see it. Yeah, mashallah. I hope they see this video. I keep my promises. Mashallah. Al Jabbar in the night. Mashallah. Yeah. Alhamdulillah, we are on Juz 5 now. And the question from yesterday is what battle is referenced in Surah Ali Imran and what year did the battle take place? So, go ahead and answer the question, inshallah ta'ala, below. All right, and Bismillah, we'll go ahead and get started today with Juz 5. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. So the verse that I wanted to cover today is verse 147 of Surah Nisa. مَا يَفْعَلُ اللَّهُ بِعَذَابِكُمْ إِنْ شَكَرْتُمْ وَآمَنْتُمْ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ شَاكِرًا عَلِيمًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Why should Allah punish you if you are grateful and faithful? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ever grateful and all-knowing. Now, subhanAllah, if you think about the previous juz, we talked about this idea of Allah Azza wa Jal mentioning the works of this world that were not done with sincerity, being blown away on the Day of Judgment as if they were nothing. Here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, what incentive, what reason would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punish a person if they combine these two qualities? Now, these two qualities have to go together. The ulama talk about this ayah and indeed the tafsir of it is, is rich and inshallah ta'ala we'll get to discuss it uh, together because I know all of our ayat uh, tie in. In shakartum wa amantum, Allah mentions gratitude and faith. Not everyone who is shakir has iman yet. Inshallah ta'ala there are some people maybe that are even uh, watching that are not Muslim yet but uh, they're grateful and that gratitude in the worldly sense leads to true gratitude which is being grateful first and foremost to your creator. Uh, which is the necessary gratitude in your relationship with him. And not every believer, not everyone who's mu'min, has the quality of shukr, has the quality of gratitude. Now the ulama say these two qualities, if they are combined in a person, gratitude and belief, then that means that nothing that happens to them in this life or in the next is a manifestation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's punishment. That means the hardships that come your way are meant to elevate you they are not meant to punish you for things that you have done if you are acting in the capacity of gratitude and faith. And of course, we fall short of these qualities in our day to day. So this isn't you know, uh, entirely applicable to every single moment of our lives, but generally speaking, shukur is met, gratitude is met with blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
faith is met with protection from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the scholars say, look at the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In shakartum, let's say those who do acts of gratitude are not believers. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam teaches us that those people who do acts of goodness, that do acts of gratitude, they have their reward given to them in this life. Meaning there is a concept of someone being charitable or doing something good that is not a believer and so they cannot expect the reward on the day of judgment, in the hereafter, because Iman is what makes that shukur rewardable in the hereafter. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala still may give them some of the reward of their good in this life, right? And that's from the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But when you have shukur and Iman, when you have gratitude and belief, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would increase the goodness in this life and certainly even more so in the next life, right? So all of the ayat, all of the ahadith, about spend and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will spend on you. Give and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give to do for others and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will do for you. All of that still applies, but the believer seeks the reward in the hereafter primarily and that's where the reward is assured for the believer. And so if you face hardship and test and trial, even as you are being shakir, even as you're being grateful and being a believer, then know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving you what will increase you and bi-idhnillahi ta'ala be a manifestation of His grace upon you in the long run. So Iman and Shukr go together and that's where the true goodness of a person comes out. That's where the full reward comes out. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَكَانَ اللَّهُ شَاكِرًا عَلِيمًا And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ever grateful and ever uh, knowledgeable, all-knowing. Two things the ulama mentioned here that are very important. Number one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not allow you to outdo him in ihsan. If you do acts of good, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will always do better towards you. That's number one. So the shukur is repaid. In shakartum, if you are grateful, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is shakir. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who is grateful. And when it comes to being alima, when it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, knowing the scholars of tafsir, many of them say this is connected to the iman part, to the faith part. Don't say that you are this or you are that. Allah knows the iman that is in your heart. Allah Azawajal knows if your claim to faith is true. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us worthy of that. The last thing that I will mention in this regard is that if that becomes the case, if a person is shakir and alim, you know, and you come to this understanding, this husn al of Allah, this good expectation of Allah, that Allah Azawajal does not like destroying your efforts and Allah Azawajal does not punish in vain. In this situation, Compare this then to the verse in Surah Al-Baqarah when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the believers who say, uh, who want Jannah, am hasibatum an tadkhulul Jannah, do you think that you will gain paradise? And then you learn from those who came before you and the hardships that came to them, mastatumul ba'sa'u wa darra' wa zurziru, that they were struck with all sorts of hardships until they said, mata nasrullah, when is the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala coming? So Allah Azza wa Jal was testing them in accordance with the paradise they were seeking. And of course, Allah Azza wa Jal mentions to us in Surah Al-An'am, verse 43, the opposite, which is those who forgot Allah and Allah Azza wa Jal punished them by opening the gates of this world, the ease of this world. We open to them everything that they wanted of this world as a means of punishment. So may Allah Azza wa Jal make us believing and grateful servants of His that are repaid in this life and in the next. Allahumma ameen. Shaykh Abdullah, tafadl. Barakallahu feekum. Uh, it's important that subhanAllah, when talking about those deeds that one performs and the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's a, a small, you know, uh, it's a fine line to where when one does a good deed or one thinks that their deeds get them to a certain maqam or position, they may think that they are chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we see in this chapter, in the chapter of An nisa chapter number four, verse 48, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala within the context is talking about those that claim that they were the chosen ones, the chosen people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ends it or asks a question. It's a rhetorical question where we know the answer. Where he says that A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim Alam tara ila ladhina yuzakkuna anfusahum Badillahu yuzakki man yasha wa la yudhlamuna fatila Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Have you not seen those who boast of their righteousness 
Alam tara ila ladhini yuzakkuna anfusahum. And this ru'ya is, is a ru'ya, it's not actually seeing, but it's actually understanding with insight. And do you understand and are you able to discern and decipher the one that get, that praises themselves? So when you do an action or if you're from a certain background, and you praise yourself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, have you not seen that person, encountered that person, understand those types of people that claim that they are something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not claimed that they were, to where because of a good deed or some type of deed or some type of background that one may have, Allah is asking this question, have you not seen the ones that yuzakuna anfusahum? Now what's interesting is that we may see this word tazki in other chapters of the Quran, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, qad aflaha man zakkaha those are successful, the ones that uh, purify it, or those that are not successful, the ones that debase it or lower it. And the one, a lot of the, the scholars talk about this, it's not the, it could not be, it may not be a, the, the person themselves, but it, it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that does the tazkiyah. Zakkaha yani Allah yuzakki shakhs. The one that has the tazkiyah is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which another understanding could be qad aflaha man zakkaha, the one that does the actions of tazkiyah. Mm -hmm. They're not claiming that they are the righteous, but they're doing the actions of righteousness. And that coincides with the statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, man tawadha alillah rafa'ahu Allahu. The ones that lower and debase themselves for Allah, not for a lineage, not for a nationality, not for a background. The ones that lower themselves for Allah, Allah will raise them. Allah will raise them. So the, Allah SWT is asking this question, Allah is the one that uh, grants the righteousness to whom he wills. And this is important. When we talk about tawakkul, trusting in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as was mentioned, we trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in times of hardships, but in general, we trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that whatever we do, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never oppress anyone or anything in any way, shape, form, or fashion. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a latif. He is the subtle one. He understands the subtleties, he knows the subtleties, and he gives in kindness. And he is al-khabir, that he is aware of all the intricacies and minutiae of the things that we may not even be aware of. And when speaking about the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the predestination, there is nothing that surpasses him or nothing that he is unaware of. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does tazkiyah, claims righteousness, he gives awsaf, he gives characteristics of those in the Quran. When he speaks about the mu'minun, for example, those that are the mu'minun, those that are in their salatihim khashi'un, those that are attentive and have their undivided attention in their prayer. So Allah is the one that gives the tazkiyah. And that's why when we pray someone, we say, Allah hasibuhu nahsibuhu kadalik. I say, this is a good brother, Allah is a counter, and that's how we understand and that's what we know from, from the zahir, from what we see in the apparent. We don't know what is hidden in his or her heart. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ultimately is the one that gives the tazkiyah. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ends it, بِلِلَّهُ يُزَكِي مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَلَا يُظْلَمُونَ فَتِيلًا And then he says, and they are not wronged even as much as a husk of a date stone. So you see fatila, you see qitmir, you see these words in the Quran, subhanAllah, that speak about the minutiae of a thing to show that nothing is hidden from Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-adl, he is the just, giving everything its due right, even the, the, the fatila. And some say the fatila is the center line of the date seed, or some would say it is the covering, which some would say also is uh, the qishra, like the skin of the date, or some would say the line what we see in the date seed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that small amount, he would not even oppress that small amount of anyone or anything. So when one tries to be a good person, the best that they can be, you will notice the more you know about yourselves is the more you know about your sins and you know about the, your shortcomings, which makes you more humble, which is a sign of humility, which increases us in our Iman. And inshallah ta'ala, we're going to capitalize on what it means to be a good person and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala defines that. My beloved Sheikh Muhammad al-Shinawi. I appreciate the setup, man. Alhamdulillah. Bismillah. Salaam ala Rasulillah. Ali Sahib Ajmain. You know, it's uh, it's very correct what some scholars said about you know the the rays that come from the sun. You can't really count them; they're innumerable, mm -hmm. and that is sort of the created light of Allah. So, what about the Quran itself, right? Which is uh, uncreated, which is the divine light. You can never count the rays. And Sheikh Omar, 
uh, and yourself, both of you sort of, uh, not that I'm sort of, I've, I've covered that much ground at all in Quranic studies in my life, but you made connections for me that I, I can't believe I didn't notice in the surah. Because when I came here sort of thinking, uh, I can spend some time discussing, uh, it, it lights up a lot, sort of the interconnecting principles. It's, it's so wonderful. I mean, on the one hand, you know, Sheikh Omar, you began with, uh, what does Allah get out of punishing you? You know, it, there's an implication there of Allah doesn't get anything out of punishing you. Mm. And that already answers a question that shaitan can continue to pester until he's able to slip into someone's mind, which is like, does God care or does he not care? Mm. Like, is he just there to wait till I slip up, but he's indifferent? Uh, and subhanAllah, that, that ayah tells you very clearly, like, I'm letting you know, I have no interest. I get no benefit. I prefer not to, right? Mm. Uh, and there are other ayat in Surah an nisa that have the same meaning, subhanAllah. The one ayah says, uh, Allah wishes, he, he has a preference. He wishes that he turn to you in grace and those who are obsessed with their desires, with their carnal lusts and their sort of their shallow worldly thrills, they wish that you deviate a great deviance. And so Allah wants you for you, for your own good, right? He, he is invested in your best interests. Mm, As for anyone else, they want you for them. So that whole notion of like, what does God want from me? What's with all these rules, <laughs> right? <laughs> the, actually, the very next ayah says, the ayah mm -hmm. right after that says, uh, Allah wants to lighten your burdens. And the human being uh, was created, humankind is created vulnerable, weak. And so he wants to protect you from the edge of the cliff that you don't even notice under your feet. He wants to protect you from your weaknesses and your vulnerabilities and you swaying, even if you may be a good person at heart, meaning a good person originally, that doesn't mean you're a good person indefinitely. Mm, it's a very important so. point. Like we believe, we don't believe human beings are created into sin, but we believe human beings have a propensity mm -hmm. to get sabotaged by their impatience, by their short-sightedness, by their weakness. To, and you know, without getting into like clunky moral philosophy terms, like what do you need to be a good person? You gotta believe goodness exists, not for another day. Mm -hmm. You gotta be able to define goodness, right? Because everyone says, yeah, good, but no one on the spectrum of the moral debates actually believes I'm a bad person. They're mm -hmm. disagreeing on the definitions of good, right? The person that says I'm, and I always use this example, let's say I'm pro-life in the abortion debate. Uh, you know, they are not against freedom and choice. It's just they believe it doesn't apply here in this way, right? And those who say I'm pro-choice, right? It's mm -hmm. her body, her choice type thing. They don't mean I'm pro-murder, right? Mm -hmm. They just don't believe this is murder, right? The late-term mm -hmm. abortion, if we're speaking specifically here. And so what is the definition of good is another discussion. Mm -hmm. But for, for the sake of here and now, in the interest of time, even those that have a definition, albeit arbitrary, albeit short-sighted, albeit biased, more so than we realize, the motivational structure is the third component you actually need to be committed to goodness, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the spiritual refinement, the, mor the moral fortitude, right? To commit yourself to your own principles, even when it's inconvenient per se, right? Or uh, immediately inconvenient at least, right? Mm -hmm. You think Surah An-Nisa speaks a lot about that. So then he says, speaks about don't sort of uh, uh, praise yourselves. Mm -hmm. Don't think it's sort of like forever and unconditional, right? Mm -hmm. the, the ayah you even began with, subhanAllah, Shaykh Omar, it says Allah does not wish, that's the sort of the intended meaning, Allah does not wish to punish you if you're faithful and thankful, and thankful and faithful. It says, وَكَانَ اللَّهُ شَاكِرًا عَلِيمًا But Allah is most appreciating for the little that we do, but He's also knowing. So do you know yourself well enough? Do you know what lurks mm -hmm. inside the inner crevices of your heart? And that is where the motivational structure comes from. Sort of, is it in, is it in the right place? Has it been compromised? Uh, like Surah An-Nisa speaks about free, like family structures. It speaks about inheritance, estate distributions. Do, do you know your place in this? Because some people imagine like in this day and age from too close, too granular of a look, they say, wait a minute, how come he gets double what she gets? And a long time ago, by the way, in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu they'd be like, what do you mean the granddaughter gets a third and the grandpa gets a sixth. <laughs> it would be the opposite yeah. objection. Do you know your place? Uh, how come the prophet was not sent in this ethnicity or that tribe? How come the prophet wasn't this gender or that gender nowadays, right? The ayah in Surah Nisa says, 
Don't wish. Mm. What's happening in here? Do you wish something different than what Allah's perfect wisdom has ordained? And the final ayah actually that comes to mind about this is uh, فَإِنْ أَطَعْنَكُمْ فَلَا تَبْغُوا عَلَيْهِنَّ سَبِيلًا If they respect your leadership in the household, right? This is an address to men. Then don't seek a means of transgression. Don't overdo it, right? Do you know your place? You are not God, right? God gave you some respective room for the cohesion and harmony of the marital journey, right? إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ عَلِيًّا كَبِيرًا The ayah ends by saying Allah is most exalted, most great. So it's, it's, it's like, you know, Allah Azawajal is not just prescribing the way that you can be grateful to Him for the blessings that you recognize, but also teaching you to recognize blessing and some of the things that you might see as constricting, right? And some of these orders, some of these structures, some of these rules, laws, you know, might come off as constriction. And that also is something that we should thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for. You know, you're at a place in your journey of faith when you start to say, Alhamdulillah for the restrictions. When you start to say, Alhamdulillah, you know, there's one part of it where you're looking as if you wish that you weren't Muslim, as if you wish you weren't a believer. I wish we could do that. I wish we could do this, right? And then you get to a place where, you know, Alhamdulillah, uh, I'm pleased that I know that this is better for me. Then Allah Azza wa Jalla might just even open your heart up to say, Alhamdulillah, I'm not like that. You know, two people can. Actually, I'll tell you a story. Subhanallah. Actually, mm-hmm. recent trip to the to the UK where I brought these back. <laughs> um, shout out to the Iman Channel brothers, by the way, who hooked it up. Mashallah. Um, I was uh, walking. I was actually there New Year's Eve, right? We we had the Light Upon Light conference. Went outside, and you could see people New Year's Eve. People going out to the pubs or whatever it is. And it's like, we're just trying to get to our car. And as a Muslim, you could see all that happening. Mm -hmm. And you could think, I wish I could be with them. Or you could say, you know, it is what it is. I'm not with them. Or you could say, Alhamdulillah, I'm not in that life. And thank Allah for it, right? And that's where constriction is actually blessing. There was a brother in my masjid. I may have shared this prior. Uh, I don't recall who or where, but Quran repeats itself. So why can't we, right? But you reminded me. You know, he had shown up after Jum'ah one day. A brother in the masjid had brought him from school, I think senior in high school, to a copy of the Quran. I start noticing him attending Jum'ah. So one day I'm sort of giving salams to the crowd and he's still waiting. So I'm like, oh, he must be waiting for me. Walk up to him like, hey man, what's going on? You Muslim yet? (laughs) Uh, And he's like, no, not yet. So I'm like, what is it? Like, what's... He's like, you know, Islam is strict. And so I'm thinking, I'm revving up to respond the way I usually respond to some Muslims who want to know why there's so many restrictions. So I'm taking a deep breath, lining up the thoughts. Before I could actually explain, he said, and that's what I love about it. I was like, what? He said, my father ruined our family for Mm. 20 years because of his alcoholism. And the only reassurance I have that I will not do that to my family when I have one one day is Islam's zero tolerance policy on alcohol. Allah, like, I was like, man, can, can I borrow you? Like, can I <laughs> tour you around? Uh, and alhamdulillah, I took a shahada a few minutes later. Another brother jumped in, prompted him, and he took a shahada. And we, we, we are, sometimes, you know, you need to see the dark from a safe place. Of course, Umar used to say that, radiallahu an, that satun qad ur al-islam urwatan urwa, that sort of the, the, what's been the knots of Islam. Imagine Islam is sort of like a continuum of things getting fast and getting fast and getting established. Islam will unravel essentially. He said, one knot at a time. Once there is born into Islam, someone who inherits it. You know, you just you inherit stuff, money or other, you just take it for granted, right? You didn't work hard, not blood, sweat and tears you put into it. Uh, and once they're bo- there is born into Islam, those that didn't know Jahiliyyah. And that's why the children of the Sahaba, as amazing as they were, they weren't the Sahaba, as Ibn Taymiyyah said, Rahimahullah. No, it's beautiful. I mean, subhanAllah, you know, when you think about, this reminded me so much when you're speaking and about the youth, how you mentioned, you know, you go out on New Year's Eve and you'll see maybe even your old friends partying or things that you used to do. You know, whether it's the people, people that were Muslim and they, you know, they had their tests or the youth or converts to Islam. You know, it's, those are the stages. Man, I kind of wish I was there with them or, or it's whatever. Then you reach that, Alhamdulillah, I am not amongst them, right? It's the stages and realizing, you know, when I was studying Sharia, you know, it was interesting studying Islamic law. When you change the rules to guidelines, 
You know, the deen of Islam is guidelines with godly objectives. You know, your perception. Yeah. And I think with the iman, it changes the perception as well. I think that's from the asrar, you know, from the secret acts of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that the way that you view things and how you look at it from an Islamic worldview rather than my own personal intellect and understanding. But that takes the process. It's a process of continuing to work towards that by doing the actions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has legislated and trusting within him and trusting in him and his names and attributes. There's a connection that I was thinking about between Al-Baqarah, Ali Imran, and Nisa. In the end of Al-Baqarah, uh, you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for takhfif, to lessen the burden. Until the end, like, oh Allah, don't burden us beyond our scope. And then in Ali Imran, Rabbana la tuzigh qulubana ba'da idh hadaytana. Oh Allah, don't let our hearts deviate after you've guided us. In Surah An-Nisa, it's very interesting, subhanAllah, Allah Azza wa Jal is expressing to you that He wants to, you khafifa ankum. You read Allah, you khafifa ankum, right? That you're kind of getting to this idea. And, and he's, he's expressing that, subhanahu wa ta'ala, with the way that the law is being given to us now. If your mind is right, if your heart is right, and if your intention is right, then you'll start to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for things that you might have thought prior to that were actually going to be a burden. The burden becomes a blessing, subhanAllah. So. Surah An-Nisa, you just activated that. Surah An-Nisa says that the hypocrites see their prayers as a burden and they foot drag to them. Mm-hmm. And then it says, mudhabdhabin, and they're always back and forth. So that's how you have that inner conflict. And then Allah forbid, there's the scariest iteration all in a nisa that they're in the lowest pit of the fire. So mm-hmm. it, it doesn't happen overnight. That process of like feeling the FOMO and then getting healthier. Also, there is sort of the process of sort of taking it for granted. Mm-hmm. And then may Allah forbid you fall out altogether. And the fear factor is important. You know, part of how do you be a good person? Like one of the greatest self harms of modern psychology is just to remove all guilt and all fear. But Allah who created us knows that's Fear is like that torch that you go into the, the corners of your heart with to figure out what's, what's hiding, Allah. right? Yeah. So, it, it is so he knows that a healthy dose of this is, is healing for us. It's therapeutic yes. for us. You know, there's a brother, just because my guy, Saud from the UK is here. Uh, <laughs> there's a brother, he's on YouTube somewhere. He shared his story. He says he was a monster. He says that I was a criminal. I was a monster. I think his name now is Hamza. And like he was about to do a lot of time in prison. His mom sent him to an aunt, his aunt like in another town. He worked in a department store and he was still vulgar, sort of callous. Mm-hmm. A bunch of Muslim sisters started like giving him tough da'wah mm-hmm. and telling him, if you don't chill out, Allah's gonna stuff your face in the hellfire. <laughs> <laughs> but Allah knows that this is sort of a the way measured it. dose for some people, right? Mm-hmm. So he said, in my sort of rebellion, my arrogance, I said, so what? I've had friends be in a burning building for, you only feel it like for a minute, then you're fine. Oh, she said, man. actually, in Surah An-Nisa, Allah said, every time their skins roast, Allah, we replace them with other day. skins so that they can taste, experience the burning anew. May Allah protect us. May Allah protect us. He said, I was paralyzed. Like, how does God know what I'm thinking? How do I know? God is know my, sort of my dismissal of these things. He said, now is the beginning of me starting to take it seriously. Subhanallah. And alhamdulillah, he's a da'iya now. He's a quality. Oh, mashallah. 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 I, uh, just a shout out on your pa- your papers that uh, deal with the, the problem of evil. What's the title? Where can we find it? I know it's in Yaqeen, but what's the title of it, mashallah? Yeah, very, very I mean, good. there is actually a, a, the, the paper on uh, hellfire in general. How is Allah the most merciful in hellfire? Because you always need that balance, mm-hmm. right? And even Surah Anissa, because it's so scary, Surah Anissa, to make you a good person, it says, mm-hmm. you know, Allah doesn't forgive shirk, will forgive anything less than that, right? right? And it'll tell you if you stay away from the big sin, the big sins, Allah will forgive you for the little ones. So there's like that consolation because you need it, right? And so there's a paper on the, uh, the most merciful and the question of hellfire that came to mind, but I didn't get a chance to, to make mention of it. But the pro- God's existence and the problem of evil, right? And human mm-hmm. suffering is, uh, I think, under the systematic theology. Systematic theology. Uh, archives, yeah. Jazakumullah khair. Well, we could go all, all day. Yeah. Barakallah fikum. Abu Abad. So Sheikh Abu Abad, Shanawiya, actually, of course, runs systematic theology in the department. If you go to the uh, website, click his author profile, you get all the papers. Mashallah, he's written some great papers that Mashallah, all relate to this. Accept and forgive. We enjoyed and having and you and uh, with us as always. Barakallah fikum. Inshallah ta'ala for the rest of you. We will see you all uh, tomorrow, inshallah ta'ala. Barakallah fikum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.